Hello and welcome to the National Security Conversation with me, Happy Moon Jacob. The summit meeting between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has just been concluded in the city of Wuhan in China. While we are still awaiting the details of the summit meeting, there aren't too many expectations in terms of agreements and declarations coming out of this meeting. In fact, the two leaders went into this meeting without too many expectations themselves and therefore the meeting has been called an informal summit. In that sense, this summit has been about going back to the negotiating table, not about negotiating anything new or different. Sino-Indian relations have been under great stress lately, especially in the aftermath of the Doklam standoff at the trijunction between Bhutan, India and China. There has been a lot of rhetoric, mudslinging and propaganda between the two sides in the wake of the Doklam crisis. The Wuhan summit needs to be viewed in the context of this vitiated atmosphere and for a desire for, and a desire for stability and rapprochement between the two sides. The summit in that sense has perhaps provided a much needed toe and rapprochement between India and China. This is certainly a good beginning. But there are several questions that needs to be answered. Has this summit meeting come too late in the day to have achieved anything substantive? Is this summit meeting more about optics rather than about substance. Will the two sides be able to translate the warmth in Wuhan to their day-to-day -day military engagements on their border? Is the international system conducive for a Sino-Indian entente cordial? These are some of the important questions that we need to ask at this point now that the Wuhan summit has been over. To talk to us about this and more, we have Professor Alka Acharya from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Alka Acharya is a professor of Chinese studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. She was until recently the director of the Institute of Chinese Studies in New Delhi. She was also the editor of China Report, one of the finest academic journals on China. She was also a member of the National Security Advisory Board of the Government of India. Professor Alka Acharya, welcome to the National Security Conversation. Thanks, Happy. Professor Ajaria, could you give us some general background to the run-up to this informal meeting that we just saw taking place in Wuhan? Um, I think you uh, did refer to Dokulam as having uh, uh, constituted a kind of a low point in the relationship. Uh, last year in summer for 73 days, right. both armies from both sides were facing each other. Uh, a new law as well in the kind of invective that came out from uh, both sides, uh, more on the Chinese side one must admit. Surprisingly, the two sides um, did make repeated references to 1962 that we are not the India of 1962 and China said neither are we. You know, so this brought the entire discourse to a completely new low. Right, right. And uh, especially when for the last 20 years we have been patting ourselves on the back that well we are, we are more or less getting past 1962, new treaties have come up, quiet border, not a shot fired and all these kind of things and in fact both the sides take considerable pride in the fact that this is one of, it's the longest contested border and yet it is the quietest. So I think Doklam really um, brought the two sides up against a very, very formidable issue that is the mm. substantial achievement of the Sino-Indian relationship actually going to just fritter away uh, because of this. Uh, so that was one of the wake up calls and uh, I think the second part was also that this is a new element in the whole boundary dispute that it is not just about what India and China between us uh, are uh, dealing with but then now we are also getting problems CPEC on this side and uh, the Doklam which involves the Bhutan India China trijunction on the other side. So clearly it is becoming a much more complex kind of an issue. So in, in other words there was a sense that things were getting out of control and there was the, there was the desire to bring things back on track. Yes and so, so when we are looking at the run up to Wuhan, so Doklam uh, becomes a very significant watershed where suddenly as I said mm. that this was kind of where, where have we reached. But equally the intensity of Doklam was uh, heightened by the 
few years preceding where the two sides literally seemed to be pitted opposite each other on a range of issues. Um, there were um, questions about um, China's support to Pakistan with regard to terrorism, its uh, unwillingness to concede India's demand uh, that they should support permanent membership of the Security Council and other minor irritants that did uh, play up. It seemed as if the two sides were no longer considerate about each other's sensitivities. So where was the meeting point? Where were, and of course, in the midst of this, then the talk would come up about how even the economic ties were not showing the kind of dynamism. It was highly unbalanced and so on. So all in all, I think Doklam brings us to a point when the relationship has been steadily unraveling in many ways and not very, um, positive mm -hmm. momentum and a not a very uh, positive uh, political uh, sort of uh, right. interaction. So in that sense, in that context of a desire to build uh, stability between the two sides, what do you think are some of the key achievements of the, of the, of the Wuhan summit? Uh, I think one of the things that uh, uh, the two leaderships have um, 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 said is that they will issue strategic guidance to their respective militaries to strengthen communications and build trust and understanding. Um, what does this really mean? Does it mean that the militaries of India and China were behaving in a, in a particular manner on the border without the green signal or go ahead by the political establishment? Now the political establishments today think that it is important to um, um, tell their militaries to behave themselves. I mean, how, is, is that is that is that is that a correct way of reading uh, this this particular statement? Well, I think uh, in effect it would boil down to that because uh, some of the analysis that I have seen seem to suggest that many of these incursions are happening not just because of the fact that there is a difference of perception about where the line of actual control runs, uh, but also because. Uh, army commanders on the ground are taking it unto themselves uh, to um, take these patrols into uh, undefined territory. Uh, so for instance, when um, Xi Jinping was visiting India and the, uh, the incursion that happened and uh, just proceeding uh, along with the visit, it was suggested that this happened because the army commander did not have contact with the headquarters. Uh, now, it may seem strange, but uh, if we look at what is being discussed at Wuhan now, it would appear that possibly there is some disjunct or disconnect uh, between the people who are in those very far flung territories and sometimes uh, 15 days away from the nearest uh, yeah. controlling point, possibly there could be some miscommunication. Uh, so, Professor so Rajendra, this is this is very important because in many ways what this means is that despite the desire of the two political establishments to maintain stability between two strong powers in Asia, tactical factors, local level military factors can create problems at the strategic level. Isn't that what that, it is? That is what this, this uh, new direction to the military would suggest. Though, uh, to be fair, I would say that uh, maybe the local uh, level uh, commanders are not doing this as a deliberate kind of, because in the problem is that there is no line of control which is mutually agreed upon. So there is, there is that perception uh, gap. Um, how do this, uh, the, 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 this new strategic, how does this new strategic understanding that they will communicate to the commanders be translated on the ground? Because let us, let, let us keep in mind that this is a huge length of territory and there are areas which are completely like probably no man has gone there before kind of thing. Uh, the points where the actual um, things, uh, the, the, in, the, the incursions are happening or where the, um, sometimes they come face to face are about 15 or 20 along this line. Yeah. These are the points. Um, so I think it is not a very difficult matter to control the process of this engagement at those very critical points. They, they are with reference to certain passes, they are adjacent to certain territories, they are located in some of the well-worn routes. These are the areas where there, are, there is this possibility of a misunderstanding. And I think that's, that's probably what will now be uh, attended to. So you would then argue that this is probably one of the 
best outcomes of this meeting that they have put their heads together and sort of recognized the problem as it were and said hey this needs to be done and issued a strategic guidance so wouldn't you say that this is one of the the the, the best outcomes of this summit meeting look if we are keeping doklam in the background uh, and then sort of looking at this new understanding that they seek to the strategic understanding which will be communicated to the military commanders. I, I don't think the two are quite directly linked because Dokulam did not involve a misperception in, in, the, in the way in which other incursions are between India and China. This involved a third country as well right. and India went in because uh, Bhutan requested the help as is uh, as we are informed. In, in one sense these incursions are structurally structurally part of this situation at the moment. So, and, and they say that it's not a big deal. Whether it has been the UPA in power or the NDA, the same kind of statement has been made. So, I am therefore suggesting that it's not the incursions per se, but because the boundary is such a sensitive issue and because the idea is that uh, we should reduce these incursions because A, they tend to inflame public opinion, B, they tend to always arouse within the strategic communities on either side a certain um, negativity about the intentions of the other. It's best to control this process. To that extent, I think it's good because it sends again, very importantly, a signal that the political leadership is committed to ensuring that there is peace and tranquility and whatever whatever further prophylactics are needed by all means we welcome it. Uh, I do believe that our focus is overly on management and once again we have come up with, uh, with yet another scheme uh, by which we seek to manage the border whereas I think now we have reached that point where we now need to actively move towards resolving. But indefinitely to focus only on how to just keep managing a contested border is bound to create situations in the future again. And so I think now, I hope at the informal level, maybe the two have said, okay, while we need to still show that the management is important, we need to move towards, I mean, can we see, there are slight indications that maybe consideration of resolving the boundary could begin. What makes you say that? Because there is, there is a clear worrying lack of incremental progress towards the border negotiations and, pro and, and resolving the border conflict as it were. Um, you have the National Security Advisor of India who is the special representative for um, Sino-Indian boundary talks. Uh, he has absolutely no time in his hands. I mean, how, many time, how many things will he manage? So, to my mind, the very fact that you appoint the National Security Advisor to have talks with China on the border issue shows that there is only so much progress that will take place. Uh, you have pro forma visits, you have informal summits, you have the, the, the uh, National Security Advisor as the, as the representative for boundary talks. So this, so this actually means there is not going to be much of a, an incremental progress towards the resolution. No, I think if you look at the various kinds of documents that have come about or the kind of statements that have been made or, um, or even the writings by some of the former officials, uh, you will see that it, it appears that much of the negotiations about what needs to be done has been completed. The question now is how do you bring about the quid pro quo mm -hmm. and over that I think you need the right ambience. You certainly can't have an ambience where you are doing a quid pro quo, where may you may be, possibly you may be compromising on certain kind of uh, parts of the territory in a situation where China is seen as a possible um, threat, uh, an enemy and so on. So, I feel that the, the ambience is now being sought to be created by this informal summit. Professor Acharya, this is a very interesting point that you are making, that much of the negotiation on the boundary is probably over. What needs to be done now is for the two heads of the government to come together um, and to agree on the quid pro quo. What needs to be done in order to sort of sign that final final document? Um, what is missing? What is lacking? I mean, what what needs to be done for the two sides to get to that point? I think informally, oh, what we gather is that the s negotiations are now stuck on Tawang. Mm -hmm and that what had initially been uh, 
uh, virtually promised by the 2005 agreement that settled populations will not be disturbed. Uh, it seems that there is some rethinking now happening within China because uh, Tawang is now being associated with a very strong spiritual uh, aspect in terms of the Tibetans and their, um, their feelings and therefore now it appears as if there is some kind of a rethinking in China about the status of Tawang. So therefore, I think the question now is going to be a very delicate one because obviously Tawang is uh, apart from the spiritual because we also have a substantial Buddhist population for whom Tawang is equally Correct. important Correct. Uh, but strategically the location of Tawang is very critical for India's security. So these are the issues and in fact I remember uh, when I was a part of the National Security Advisory Board uh, the, the, there was actually a, a very interesting discussion as to how can we ensure that both India and China have stakes in Tawang. And can we evolve some mechanism whereby Tawang could be a jointly kind of uh, looked at by the two, uh, the two countries and you know so, so there are interesting ideas which have been floating around but uh, when it comes to uh, you know high politics and when it comes to national projections I think these ideas tend to get lost uh, and I mean they are not even considered uh, as part of the the overall uh, process. In other words, we know what to do, but we don't have the political courage and willingness to do that. To go back to the earlier question that I asked, um, there is also an announcement for a joint economic project in Afghanistan. How do you view this? Does it, will it create um, uh, problems in Sino-Pakistan relations? How will Pakistan respond to that? For, for, for instance, Pakistan has been very clear um, uh, for a very long time that um, India should get out of Afghanistan. This is, this is our backyard, India has no role to play here. So a Sino-Indian joint economic project in Afghanistan, that might come as a surprise for Pakistan. How do, you, how do you see this? I doubt it. I doubt it. I think this is not something very new. Uh, you know, I'm part of um, Track 2 Dialogue, which is a Russia-India-China Academic Scholars Conference. Uh, um, which has been going on for the last 15 years and uh, nearly about 6 to 8 years ago uh, this idea was mooted in one of the conferences. Uh, the Chinese responded very enthusiastically and um, of course they were Chinese scholars but they were representing institutions which are affiliated to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and so on. Um, so this uh, proposal came up, it was sent also as part of a report. Uh, to the concerned authorities um, and I do not think that uh, we have actually pushed the Chinese enough uh, with regard to Pakistan uh, and some of the aspects over there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have made it too much of a problematic issue between China, between India and Pakistan and therefore the role of China such as it could be is not even considered. For instance, the Chinese enthusiastically saying that yes, a giant joint project would be very good means that they know they can convince the Pakistanis not to stand against it or that they will be able to reassure the Pakistanis that this is, does not mean diluting the Sino-Pakistani special relationship. So I think we have a possibility now of various forms of collaboration which can bring in Pakistan and give it equal stakes along with us and the Chinese in Afghanistan which is not a bad uh, outcome to my mind otherwise you would always have a situation where two countries are working and third is working at cross purposes. Um, Afghanistan would also benefit I think but the whole point is that how do you actually balance out the different equations and the different expectations uh, from the from the three parties? I think sometimes uh, it may be interesting to call the Chinese bluff and uh, take it up and see how it goes. You know, we 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 reject those possibilities. We completely refuse we to consider them about cooperating in CPEC or cooperating in Afghanistan. I mean these are new ideas of course uh, and uh, certainly requires time for the establishment to get around their very traditional views. Uh, scholars of course can 
keep playing with these ideas uh, and throwing them around. But I think it would be useful to think in terms of a China-Pakistan-India dialogue uh, on Afghanistan to begin with. The whole scenario is changing. You have the Russians now coming in in a very different way. A whole of Central Asia is opening. You don't have access to Central Asia. Uh, you are literally um, bound uh, in one sense <coughs> by your limited access. How do you break out of it? Some, some kind of radical thinking has to be thought. You can't possibly go across the ocean or overland or whatever um, all the time. I think so. So the point I'm coming back to is this, that I think Afghanistan offers an interesting possibility. Professor Ajari, you made a very interesting point about calling the Chinese bluff on CPEC. And I'm going to probe that, probe that a little further. Uh, how, do, how do we call the Chinese bluff on CPEC? Um, uh, I, are you suggesting that India should try and uh, um, convince the Chinese to tweak the CPEC in a way that India can then be potentially part of it? Is that what you're getting at? Well, one of the suggestions, for instance, w India's point is that this is our territory. And by calling it the China-Pakistan the China Economic Corridor, they are actually negating India's territorial claims and India's sovereignty over the area in, concern, uh, in question. Mm -hmm. Now, how does, for instance, one of the suggestions came that supposing we change the name, we don't call it China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So that there, the, the fact that this area is contested can be somewhere part of the picture, but at least India also gets stakes in what it considers its own area. Otherwise, you are sitting on the side and watching the process unfold and simply beating your chest about your, your sovereignty and how this cannot be done. Um, somewhere we need to, so when I say let's call the Chinese bluff, would the Pakistanis agree to this? Will the Chinese be able to convince the Pakistanis? Because see, the original agreement which is constantly reiterated by the Chinese is that the Pakistanis, uh, they entered this, uh, this transfer of territory in 1963 and that once India and Pakistan sort out the problem, they will deal with whoever will be controlling it. But that was in 63 and this is 2018. 20, uh, so we have a situation where uh, the de facto control has been with one country. A third country has come in, the whole area is being developed, whether it falls or uh, succeeds or what, these are, these are different issues entirely. The question is, an area on which we claim sovereignty is being developed by two other countries and there is an offer that you be part of it. Whenever the problem gets sorted out, of course, the self-sovereignty issue will be sorted out. So, one is renaming it CPEC. That is one way of getting around the CPEC issue or calling the Chinese bluff, as you put it. What else, um, uh, w what else can you sort of suggest in terms of... Um, um, no, renaming was simply so that it does not get uh, de facto China, Pakistan gets certain legitimacy because this is territory that is uh, also ours. Yes. So okay. that, that was one that, uh, that let us not stop or stall the developmental progress. Right. Uh, let us let that continue. But you also have stakes in it. So that then the whole question about how do we push for peace in the, in, in the area and how do we consider the interests of the people in the region and how do we bring um, certain kind of progress and so on to, the, to, to this whole area, which as you know is, is one of the most backward areas. So in the context of the argument that you are making, do you then think that the Indian government reacted prematurely to the BRI and CPEC, both proposed by China? Or should, th should there have been more thinking about the strategic implications of BRI and CPEC in New Delhi? No, uh, I wouldn't say that they uh, acted prematurely. Uh, the point was that what the Chinese did was first, of course, they announced it. Um, the one problem that most Indian, um, the official establishment has had that there was no consultation involved, to which the Chinese say, we didn't consult anybody, we just put it out there and all those who are interested can talk. But the other uh, problem was that uh, the Chinese then brought in all manner of connectivity projects that were underway in Asia, outside Asia, within the rubric of Belt and Road. So that CPEC becomes one of the very significant legs mm. of the BRI, so does the BCIM, which predates the… the, right, the. Right. So 
to this India's, you could say that this this was something that was it was extremely unpalatable. Uh, one involved a question of sovereignty, and one involved something that we were already on, already going on. So you took a position that unless and until concerns of sovereignty are sorted out, we can't be part of connectivity projects. And because you therefore extrapolate that concern uh, within what are Chinese intentions? What is the strategic game plan? How do they intend to use these for their future strategic objectives? But, but the, the BRI per se, I think we could have given some more thought to it. Because it is not as if it is something that is going to only benefit China. Uh, you would not have uh, more than 60 countries around the world signing up for these projects. Uh, unless they perceived some benefit coming out to them. You have your entire neighborhood endorsing this so enthusiastically, even though uh, there are some concerns about the debt, debt trap, trap and so on. Um, you saw what the, the Sri Lankan said, um, you know, we will handle it, <laughs> we will handle it. So, I think this is a great opportunity that if this informal summit, uh, Modi can actually get these two things going. One, get China invested in our development as well and partner with China in our neighbours. You need to be present in the neighbourhood, not as a country which is blocking their options uh, for other sources, but as a country which is actually can have different strengths which they can bring to the table uh, which China cannot. So, if I paraphrase you, you are basically saying that India should not be too worried about the Chinese involvement in South Asia, in the region, in the neighborhood. It is also in a sense China's neighborhood and therefore, India and China should find ways of cooperating and collaborating in the neighborhood rather than get into a competition. You see, one thing we must recognize that the ability of the neighborhood, our neighbors to exploit this China as a countervailing factor is a direct outcome of the India-China ties. You improve India-China ties and immediately the scope for the game as it were, where China becomes kind of a savior and India is projected as, um, as, as a spoiler, uh, immediately you, you can, e you see the, the moment India-China ties start to improve, Pakistan also becomes slightly different problem. Fixing the Sino-Indian relationship is the key to sorting out the Chinese role in and, the And changing the mindset in Delhi that uh, the Chinese are encroaching into our traditional sphere of influence and therefore uh, something needs to be done to make sure that the small countries in the neighborhood do not go uh, bandwagoning the Chinese. So, I think that mindset needs to be changed. Ten years ago, we did not hear this argument from the Chinese. Today, we are hearing it. Uh, scholars are saying, what do you mean extra regional role of China in South Asia? China, South Asia is China's neighbor and we have as much of a role as any other country. Now, this is a direct outcome of the, see, it is also a structural kind of a problem, you know, because as you see the Chinese rising in their power and capacity and uh, scope, uh, they are going to play a bigger and bigger role. That's and you are, it's natural. It's, it's natural. And the question now is, how do we manage? After all, India is also seen to be now growing. Um, this asymmetry is a bit of a problem and I think that is the root of the way in which we are, um, we are trying to, to manage the, the, the China problem. Sorry to digress a bit, but um, going back to the Sino-Indian relations under Mr. Modi, things began well, very well in fact under Mr. Modi. The chemistry between Mr. Xi and uh, Mr. Modi was fantastic. But then things fell apart. Uh, now, I think the, 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 the chemistry is coming back, there is a tour, there is a rapprochement, there is a recognition that it is important to invest in stabilizing the relationship with China. What has led to this, this realization? Is it the unavoidability of Sino-Indian relations? Is it because Chinese economy is so huge that you can't avoid it? Is it because everyone else is jumping on the Chinese bandwagon? So, what has, what has led to this change of mind in New Delhi, in Mr. Modi's mind, in your opinion? I think it's a combination. It's a combination of a lot of things, uh, some of which you have mentioned. Um, first and foremost, we must uh, realize that uh, the last few years have been somewhat bizarre. You know, uh, it's not as if the issue of the Sino-Pakistani relationship was something new. 
we've been dealing with the china pakistan special relationship since the 60s um we always wondered where exactly this would lead to we are beginning to now see where exactly uh, and how exactly it can it can harm us uh, so so that's one issue uh, the second thing is that the kind of problems that came up particularly this mas uh, um uh, mas uh, azhar masood and the other issue of uh, security council membership if you see the last three um well that too but i th- i think if if you see the last few years these two became virtually a test case for sino indian friendship that if you are not going to vote against the masar masood masood azhar being declared a, a terrorist or if you are not going to support our uh, membership of the say that the entire relationship would flounder and then starting to use your own pressure tactics and so on so these irritants and these problematic issues which are part and parcel of any relationship suddenly became barriers to further development in one sense the initiative for guiding the relation india china relationship goes out and we literally are pursuing a path Uh, which is essentially about competitive power politics mm-hmm. um without uh, fully factoring in as to who would benefit out of this professor azhari but you know, notwithstanding the structural and the strategic rationale for the engagement that is taking place now um what what is the rationale for prime minister modi is is one year away from the elections uh, and and xi jinping has just come back uh, to power in in, in china what is the rationale for these two leaders to reach out and 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 make peace and sort of try and calm things down does it really benefit mr modi electorally does it is is there a domestic political rationale to it is there a domestic political rationale to it in china as a, as a scholar of china what do you think about see, it see i don't see this as some kind of a new thaw or a new anton cordial as you mentioned earlier okay. or anything of that sort uh, i see it as a kind you know that if doklam is the is the point at which the balance sort of it, it, it the whole thing became imbalanced now we we trying to retain, regain the balance and one way to regain that balance is that you reaffirm the commitment the political commitment at the highest level to this relationship as very important for both these countries and i think modi's uh, visit is essentially intended to signal that to identify the weak spots uh, to ensure that doklam doesn't happen again if you want a rational for why now yes we are less than a year away from the general elections and clearly another doklam would 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 <laughs> queer mm-hmm. a lot of pitches in india so we need to see how that doklam doesn't happen again and especially as i said in the beginning that doklam happens to be slightly different from the normal border problems um the regional dynamics are such that you your space you you being squeezed people are talking about how china's england enlarging presence in the neighborhood is is actually started to constrict in but then that's the point that you are allowing yourself rohingya to, is a good example yes to to be to be completely swamped by the situation and not making an attempt to move out of it um, by constantly opposing something that that cannot at this point be pushed back you cannot push china out of this region anymore and the so, more you withdraw the more china will come in and the more in. you withdraw the more china is coming in so in that sense the initiative seems to be going out as far as reach and, and i think mr modi is trying to regain that initiative allowing other factors to come into the india china strategic equation is has actually derailed it and mm-hmm. somewhere he wants to once again bring that on track um and finally i think the pressures that both countries are going to be facing from the new economic global uh, challenges um see at this point india is the only comparable country to china in asia with the same kind of concerns and challenges as far as economic order is concerned and for china it's very important that they partner with india in 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 dealing with these changes and finally i think so so if i am going down the order of what what mr modi mr and finally mr modi has to show something before he goes to the polls um the chinese are the only guys who can come in and actually produce 
some very impressive kind of uh, changes, particularly if they, they come in with the investment. I mean, the Japanese came in with the bullet train, what happened? We have not heard anything so far about that. <laughs> no. uh, so, you need now uh, action and rapid action implementation of certain decisions which have already been taken between India and China, fast track those. And I think so it, all you, this. You therefore say that this is the time to take a decision on the border question because the negotiations have been completed and you now have an opportunity to take that decision and that will actually go in well for Mr. I Modi. I think so. I think, I think somewhere uh, while we keep saying that okay, the border is being managed, it still is a source of suspicion and mistrust. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere now the bullet has to be bitten. Professor Acharya, you are giving me a very optimistic picture. There's a lot of, there are a lot of people in India who make the argument that Chinese can't be trusted. This, the power gap between India and China is increasing, military power, economic power, and, 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 and China is an aggressive rising power. So there is a fear in India that this, this is probably not a benign great power. This is going to be an aggressive great power. Should we be worried? Look, I you know, one problem that one has with this whole notion of because China is rising, it is aggressive, that uh, is, is something that I think has not been looked at very carefully. It, it's, it's a much more nuanced picture that is coming. Uh, as scholars of international relations, we, we, we focus on this whole nature of power in, in international relations. And the question to ask ourselves is, is China as a bigger and bigger power, any different from the kind of powers that dominated the system earlier. Uh, does China uh, behave uh, or, or use its power in the same manner as say for instance the erstwhile powers or the way in which um, interventions are done or uh, countries are sought to be overrun. Uh, I do not think we are seeing that kind of intervention or that kind of power at this point. I am not suggesting therefore that we need to be complacent about China. There are enough problems. We need to understand where the threat is, where the problems are, where the tension is. But we need to do it in an informed manner. We need to do it from our own perspectives, not from perspectives that are imported and are used as the basis for dealing with China. Professor Ajaria, great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.